Welcome to a special edition of National Geographic Channel Presents. I'm Tom Brokaw. That terrible day that we call Pearl Harbor happened 60 years ago. You might think that time has healed all the wounds, that the shock has worn off, that historians have told us all the stories there are to tell. That's not true. Pearl Harbor was so unexpected, so brutal, so chaotic, that we're still struggling to understand all that happened that day. Undersea explorer Robert Ballard wants to fill in some of the gaps. He's on the trail of a secret Japanese weapon, a flotilla of midget submarines that were trying to penetrate Pearl Harbor before the attack. This then is a story of secrecy and treachery, of Japanese warriors preparing to die for their country, of Americans completely unprepared for a day that would change their lives forever. They were 18, or 19, or 20 years old, sailors in a tropical paradise. They didn't know that on the other side of the ocean, another group of young men was preparing to strike them while they slept. Their paths would cross for a few short hours on a Sunday morning in December. And in one terrifying instant, more than 1,000 of them would die. The legacy of what happened on December 7th still haunts us today. In the first images from inside the USS Arizona, an underwater cemetery that's also an ecological time bomb. In the search for a top secret Japanese submarine, that was sunk about an hour before the attack began. The submarine's heading north, starting to die. And in the quest to learn what really happened that day. And most of all, it still lives on in the memories of the men who were there when everything changed. Just a young kid when this happened. And I've lived through it. I lost a lot of my friends. I reached down to try to help him. I scared him. Okay, bro. But I hope it never happens again. Nobody will ever know what it was like, except somebody that was actually there. They never had a chance. They didn't know what was coming. Nobody knew about it. They never woke up. This is the story of a day when the history of the world took an unexpected turn at a sleepy little port in Hawaii called Pearl Harbor. December 7th, 1941, 7 a.m. A mobile radar station on the northwest coast of Oahu picked up the signal of a massive number of aircraft approaching the island from the north. They were less than 140 miles away, moving at 180 miles an hour. A telephone call went immediately to the information center in Honolulu, 40 miles to the southeast. The call was routed to a private named McDonald, who passed it on to a Lieutenant Tyler, who had just been assigned to the job. Tyler told the radar operators not to worry about it. In his mind, it was just a squadron of American B-17s due in from the mainland. For the third time that day, the Japanese had tripped the alarm. And for the third time, no one seemed to notice. It was 7.15 a.m. At 7.40 a.m., the first wave of airplanes reached the coast of Oahu, guided by the signal from a Honolulu radio station. The bombers and torpedo planes were at 9,000 feet. 5,000 feet above them, the Zeros flew cover. The first wave began to break up into their attack formations. 
one to fly inland toward Wheeler Airfield, the other to move down the western coast to Pearl Harbor. They were the only planes in the sky. There was no sign whatsoever that the Americans knew they were about to be attacked. At 7.50 a.m., the first wave reached Pearl Harbor. Among their first targets, Hickam Airfield and the Naval Air Base on Ford Island. Clarence Miner was an airman stationed on Ford Island. After all that noise and the tin roof up there and stuff were popping around, I looked up and I saw this airplane come diving down and that big meatball and I said, oh shit. And then all, all hell all over the place was breaking loose. Bombs dropping, machine guns firing. And like I said, the things are so darn low you can throw rocks at them. Ralph Lindenmeyer was also on Fort Island. 7.55 in the morning, an explosion woke us up. I looked up at the clock when I first heard the explosion and felt it, and I said, the Japs are here. And when I looked out the window, the plane came over, and it, it had saw the meatball on the fuselage and the wings, and I could look into the pilot's face, and I could almost see him grinning. Anchored on Pier 1010 was the utility vessel Argon, where 19-year-old Charles Christensen worked in the machine shop. That's oh, that was a bad explosion. I wonder what happened. And I opened the porthole up, and I stuck my head right out, out there, you know, and oh, boy, was there ever a fire on Ford Island. I thought, oh, my goodness, something is really bad blowing up over there. It took a while for sailors and the ships at anchor to comprehend what was happening. Bert Davis, a machinist mate on the USS Selfridge, thought it was some kind of readiness drill. That's where I was standing when the planes came in. I was standing there shining my shoes. And uh, I saw these planes coming in. Came in and came right straight across where the Raleigh was. And I thought to myself, what in the hell is the Army doing holding maneuvers on a day like this? While the dive bombers hammered the airfields, the torpedo planes descended to an altitude of a few dozen feet and took dead aim at Battleship Row. Aboard the Argonne, Charles Christensen had a perfect view of the first torpedo runs. He's coming in almost straight across me at a slight angle across, and he's low enough that he's maybe 30 feet off of the water, which puts him maybe eye level or a little more from me, and I can see the man's face. He's got his helmet on, he's got his goggles on, and he's looking over the side, and when he straightened that plane out, leveled it out, he dropped that torpedo, and I thought, oh my God, look at that. And that torpedo just went as straight for the Oklahoma as it could go. This photo, taken from a Japanese plane, shows Battleship Row just after the attack began. The ripples emanating outward are the result of multiple torpedo strikes. George Smith was below deck on the battleship Oklahoma when General Porter sounded. Then all of a sudden, the guy came over to the loudspeaker, this is no shit, move it. And then we got a torpedo. I was really so scared, I didn't know what the hell was going on. The Oklahoma started to capsize almost immediately. 
when they said abandoned ship, the only way it could get out was due to the Kingsman window. We went out there, and the ship was rolling on top of us. Maybe we jumped about five feet into the water, which wasn't far. But when you turn around and see this thing coming on top of you, you swim for all you can swim and as fast as you can swim. Because we know we had to get around the big gun turrets. They were it went over so fast, I, I just was sure, I didn't know, but I was sure they were trapped inside of that because it, it just rolled right on over and there it was, keel up. George Smith had just been released from the Oklahoma's brig for going ashore without leave, and it saved his life. And when the ship got the torpedo, the brig was in the carpenter shop on board ship. And when the torpedo hit, it broke the carpenter's workbench loose, pinned the guard against the wall, the bulkhead, and he couldn't release the other men that were in the brig and they all drowned. On the far side of Fort Island, the old battleship Utah also got hit a few minutes before eight. Clark Simmons worked on the Utah as a mess attendant. And as I looked out the port, I saw a plane making a run on the Utah. And as she dropped her, the torpedo, the wing dipped, and then he straightened up, and the torpedo hit it, and another one right behind it did the same thing. And we knew that it was just a matter of time before the ship was going to sink. And actually, it took eight minutes. In eight minutes, the ship was, was history. She, she had turned turtle in eight minutes. As the line would begin to part, came over the side and began to swim toward Fort Island. And as we were swimming, they were machine gunning us from both, from both directions, from this direction, and when they came from Pearl City over here, from that direction. I saw fellas yelling and screaming. Some of the fellas in the water were asking for help. It was just, it was so chaotic. I really didn't know what was going on. But the biggest blow was yet to come. Lying inboard of the repair ship Vestal was the battleship Arizona. High overhead, a cape released an armor-piercing bomb that drifted down toward the Arizona's number two gun turret. It was about 10 minutes after eight. A motion picture camera captured the moment of impact. In that instant, more than a thousand crewmen died. Stu Headley was on the West Virginia, a few hundred feet away. One gigantic explosion. Now, when we fired the 16-inch, uh, you're inside. It sounds like thunder up in the distance. But this didn't sound like no thunder. This was one gigantic explosion. The stern of our ship lifted out of the water. But at the same time, we were getting with, hit with torpedoes. We were starting to list. But we saw about 32 men flying through the air from the Arizona. Oil from the fully fueled Arizona began to spread and catch fire. The heat was so intense, even sailors on nearby ships were threatened. So Crosin and I stripped right down to our undershorts and jumped in and swam underwater. Now we're not underwater swimmers, but we swam underwater that day because that was the hottest breath of air we ever breathed. Because that was the oil from the Arizona that was ablaze. 
The bomb had penetrated Arizona's forward magazine and ignited more than a million pounds of gunpowder. Those who were still alive found themselves in an inferno. They were in this oil that was on fire. They were trying to swim out of it. They'd come up and trying to get their breath. Their eyes, the white of their eyes was just as red as they can be. I, I, I can just see it today. The skin on their face was just falling off. And on top of that, all of this oil, and they were just drenched in oil. Davis went out in a whaleboat to pick up survivors. Oh, God, it was horrible. This, this one fella started to reach up to try to get a hold of the gunnel on the boat from the outside, and I reached down to try to help him, and I took him by the arm, and as I tried to lift like that, it scared me. <laughs> it all came off. He was dead by the time we got him in. Thirty-five minutes after the attack began, the first wave flew away, leaving behind more than a thousand dead American sailors, many of them teenagers, caught below deck when Arizona exploded and sank. Inside the memorial, a wall lists the 1177 servicemen who died on the battleship. Every returning survivor knew someone who died on December 7th. Oh, sweet up there. Smith, uh, Randolph Smith, the that machine gun. They never had a chance. They didn't know what was coming. Nobody knew about it. They never woke up. Aloha. Aloha. Oh, I was going to ask you for a big hug, but I couldn't get one in I thought maybe, yeah. I thought maybe that uh, you wouldn't want to hug an ugly old man. Oh, I, I do. I do want to. <laughs> Carl Carson was a 20-year-old sailor on the Arizona the day she went down. He decided to come back to Pearl Harbor when doctors told him he didn't have much longer to live. Well, I lost a lot of good, dear friends over there. Just, it's just awful hard to even think about it. I almost lost my own life. I hope, I hope I can make it over there all right. Get there. Okay. I need a little support. Carl has never talked very much about what happened to him that day. Now, at last, it's time. This, this is where I came out of, tier three. Right. Came back on, on this, there used to be ladders up and down the thing, and I came out the, the turret and went down. Well, I was out on deck doing the morning chores. All of a sudden, this plane come along, and. Didn't pay much attention to it because planes were landing at Ford Island all the time. And all of a sudden, the chips started flying all around me, and there was a plane that was strafing me. And uh, somebody hollered, it's the damn Japs, get undercover. The bomb went off. I learned later it went back by turret number four, about where I'd been working about 10 or 15 minutes before. And evidently, it knocked me out, ruptured both my lungs, and I got smoke inhalation, and all the lights went out. I don't know how long I laid there, but when I woke up, there was no panic down there or anything, but there was smoke and water knee deep. I run into a friend of mine that he was crying and, and asking me for help, and I looked at him in horror and the skin on his face and his arms and everything was just hanging off like, like a mask or something. And I took a hold of his arm. 
skin, skin all came off from my hand. And there was nothing in this world I could do for that boy. And that has bothered me all of my life. Well, they gave the word to abandon ship. And we just practically stepped off of the quarter deck into the water. And I guess I must have passed out and went down in the water and everything was just as peaceful and nice that it would have been so easy to just let go. And I saw this bright light and something made me come to. And so I got back up the surface of the water and, and oil all around, had water in my, oil in my teeth and, and down my throat and everything. It tasted horrible and I still taste it today. The, Oil was a fire all around. The man saw me down there, and the fire was approaching me. It wasn't about two feet from me. And he reached down and pulled me up out of the water, and that man saved my life. December 7th, 8.35 a.m., and the beginning of a brief 20-minute lull in the action. At airfields all over the island, crews scrambled to clear the runway so American planes could get in the air. Anti-aircraft guns were made ready. Field hospitals were set up to take care of the wounded many of them burn victims. The first stories of individual acts of heroism began to make the rounds. One of them was about a mess attendant on the West Virginia named Dory Miller. Miller had carried the wounded captain of his ship to safety, then taken up a machine gun and shot down at least two Japanese planes. What made this story remarkable is that Dory Miller had never handled a machine gun, much less trained on one, because he was black. And like all African Americans in the 1941 Navy, restricted to the lowest ranking jobs. 14 men received America's highest military award, the Medal of Honor for their heroism on that day. But Dory Miller, wasn't one of them. He got the Navy Cross instead. And the only reason why he didn't get the Congressional Medal because he was black, you know, and the, the Navy being what it was at that time, only could be a servant to the officers. He never gave any thought for his life or anything. He grabbed a machine gun and he just started blasting away over the side of the ship. What he did was courageous, and many of us thought that man should have been given the Congressional Medal of Honor. Two years after Pearl Harbor, Dory Miller died when his ship went down, torpedoed by a Japanese submarine. Pearl Harbor, 8.55 a.m. The seas were still boiling with smoke and flame when the second wave of the Japanese attack struck the island. This time, 167 aircraft split into two main groups. One headed inland, the other hugged the eastern coast and continued south to Pearl Harbor. But this time, the Americans fought back.
The smoke in the harbor was now so thick, the Japanese pilots had trouble seeing their targets. One of the targets was the battleship Nevada, with a hole in her side, steaming toward the channel. Dive bombers honed in on the crippled giant. If they could sink the battleship now, it might block the channel and trap the fleet in the harbor. With all of these planes coming in, when the Nevada got underway, the planes come in, dive bombing that. It looked like bees coming back to the hive. There were so many of them in there at one time that uh, it was amazing that they didn't collide. With bombs falling all around, Nevada's commander was able to run his ship aground on Hospital Point, which kept her from sinking and left the channel clear. By 10 o'clock, it was over. The second wave of attackers headed back to their carriers, leaving behind a shattered American Pacific fleet. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation. On the mainland, and Americans were stunned by the news they were hearing from Pearl Harbor. Every American alive over 65 years of age can remember exactly where they were and what they were doing when they got the news. It was a unifying event. It brought us together. Nothing else could have done it in that way. And dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December... President Roosevelt addressed the Congress the following day. A state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. By December 11th, the United States was at war with Germany and Japan, plunging it into a conflict that would forever change its place in the world. Back in Pearl Harbor, one problem survivors faced was notifying people back home that they were okay. The Navy told us that everybody send a postcard home to your parents, let them know everything's all right. Well, I got one of the last postcards out of there, and I sent it home on December the 9th, exactly when I sent it home. And uh, my mother didn't get that postcard until February, the first week of February sometime. I don't know why it took so long, but that's what it did. She didn't know if I was alive or dead. When the mailman got the card at the post office, he closed down the office and ran all the way to my house. He woke my mother and stepfather up at 6 o'clock in the morning and told them, your son's OK. Here's a card. Ha, I still have that card. My mom, she couldn't believe it. Uh, I get emotional when I think about it, how she says she, she felt. Uh, I just don't know. It just turns me on. Jack McCarran had been married to his high school sweetheart, Roberta, for seven weeks when the attack came. It wasn't until Christmas Day that she found out what had happened to her husband, who was stationed on the Arizona. The Navy Department deeply regrets to inform you that your husband, John, Harry McCarran, gunner's mate, second, U.S. Navy, has been reported wounded in action in the performance of his duty and in the service of his country. This was received by me Christmas morning, 7 a.m., December 25th, 1941. Yuck. <laughs> you know, I hate to say this, but in my entire 81 years of living, 
That was the worst time in my entire life was to have received this telegram because I had no idea whether or not my husband of 49 days <laughs> was alive or dead. Lying in a hospital on Oahu, badly burned, Jack decided to spare his new wife the horror of seeing him again. I said, tell Robert, tell Robert to forget about me and go back to Saugus. So, uh, you know, I've been burned and I, I had um, my, I didn't look like me, I guess my face and my hair was only like a, you know, shot. On top of which it being Christmas, I was 3,000 miles away from my home, 3,000 miles away from my husband. I didn't know anybody. I guess I never did write to you for a moment. No. I didn't write to her for a long time. <laughs> the state of shock I was in was almost as bad as his. But some time passed before I, I probably started coming out of it, and I was aboard the ship, and you know, I love this girl. And now uh, I realized that if I was going to survive, it would be with her. My friends and shipmates took me over to uh, the sick bay at Fort Island. And they laid me alongside the bulkhead over there. And, and I looked over another shipmate laying across from in against the bulkhead, and he was holding his intestines in with his hands. And he looked up at me, and he said, it, it sure war sure is hell, isn't it, shipmate? And I said, yeah, it is. Well, lately I was diagnosed with stomach cancer, and I don't figure I have too many more years to live. And I thought, Perhaps I might be a poor spokesman, if, so to speak, for my shipmates in telling my story so that they wouldn't be forgotten. And that's the one and only reason that I came back. And I'm a kind of a private person. It's been hard to do, but I think it was time that it needed to be told. And. Uh, I think it has been well worth it. I, I feel a lot better now. For three days after the attack, the Arizona continued to burn. The final totals from the surprise assault were staggering. More than 2,400 deaths and almost 1,200 wounded. 21 ships of the U.S. Pacific Fleet had been sunk or damaged, including all eight battleships. Over 300 airplanes had been put out of commission. Admiral Yamamoto had accomplished everything he set out to do, except destroy the American aircraft carriers. And in the fighting to come, that would prove to be a critical failure. One of the best things that ever happened in the United States was our carriers were not involved in the attack. The Yamamoto sank battleships, but the battleship was not the queen of the seas any longer. After that day, from now on, it's the aircraft carrier and the attack on Pearl Harbor for all of the losses of lives, which comes first, of course, and the losses of ships, they didn't sink any aircraft carriers. And that made what was already a very bad mistake on Japan's part even worse. But perhaps the greatest miscalculation was how the defeat would affect the American fighting spirit. Instead of being a crippling blow, it became a rallying cry. The next morning, 
the fire was still burning, and there was a ship, some of them, and I'm not for sure that some of them that still had the flag flying from yesterday. And at 8 o'clock, guess what? These ships are sitting there in the mud. It's time to raise the flag, and there's the American flag flying. Everything is fine. And then the Americans went to work. Every ship that had been hit, except the Arizona, Utah, and Oklahoma, was refloated, repaired, and put back into service. Many would take part in the battles yet to come. Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, Okinawa, and so would the men who survived that day. I grew up in the Navy. I learned a lot. When I came out of the Navy, I was six foot even, weighed 200 pounds. I actually grew up. I learned to be, a, we could say, a man. When I walk as a Pearl Harbor survivor, especially when I have my uniform on, I walk very proud. I represent the country, and I will represent it to the day I die. And then I will always be proud to be part of it. Well, Pearl Harbor to me is like beginning a new life. I may be a certain age, but it seemed that I was reborn that day. Pearl Harbor survivors are special. They have a feeling for each other and for their country. They have a comradeship that is not matched anywhere in the civilian world. The only people that I've ever met who have that kind of comradeship are foxhole buddies. These guys were in a foxholes together. It's not a feeling of we showed them. It's not a feeling of triumph. It's a feeling of we did it together. We were there. And that's what matters. It's kind of a hallowed place. It's, it's very beautiful. It, I'm, I'm amazed that it's, it's this beautiful. And I understand that there's millions of visitors every year that come by and pay respect to my shipmates. To lots of them, I know a lot of them, those were just names. But to me, they'll always be my shipmates. I think Pearl Harbor is like Gettysburg, it's like Appomattox, it's like Lincoln's assassination, it's like Yorktown and the surrender to General Washington. God help our country if it's ever forgotten. Four years after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese surrender was signed here on the USS Missouri. America was victorious in a war that began with a stunning military defeat. But in many ways, it was a defeat that strengthened us. Pearl Harbor holds a special place in our collective memory because it redefined the role of America in the world. It brought us together and set the United States on a course that would make it a superpower. It redefined the American spirit for the modern age. Like the Pearl Harbor survivors, a million Americans make a special pilgrimage to this place every year. 60 years after the battle, they come to honor the dead, but also to reflect on how that singular Sunday changed us as a nation. I'm Tom Brokaw. Thank you for joining us.